Welcome to Exploring Digital with Per, a podcast for entrepreneurs and CEOs who want their businesses to benefit from a digital first approach. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Exploring Digital with Per. I'm joined this morning by Sammy Mansapur, who's Managing Director of Agency UK. Hi, Hi Sammy. Hi, good morning, Nick. How are you doing? Really well. And yourself? You look as though you're uh, surrounded by activity. Yeah, as you can see, it's a hive of activity here at Beehive Yard. <laughs> we've got people buzzing around all at home. We've gone from uh, we've gone from one st- slash one and a half locations to about 18, 20 locations in the space of a, a year. <laughs> but also taking the opportunity, you said to to refit and uh, and you know work on improving the office environment. So you're one of the few people I've spoken to recently that's gone. No, the office is the future. We're investing in it. We 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 want still want this to be our you know our, our, our space, and you've really gone for it, gangbusters. So. How how are you feeling about that in lockdown three that we're well, in? Well, you now? know what they say: when everyone else zigs, zag. So <laughs> everyone else is getting out yeah. of property. What do we do? Invest in it. It's mental, isn't it? Um, but almost as mental as starting an agency in the recession, which is what we did in two thousand and eight. But uh, there you go. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, obviously, no one could foresee what was going to happen post lockdown one. We've been threatening to refit our working environment, which I I believe and our, our, the team believe is a really important component to uh to everyday work and um so we took the opportunity to completely refit it um and i think we were all back in for about three or four weeks and uh and then we went traveled back out into into lockdown again so we haven't been in a situation where everyone's been able to to come in having said that going forward we're not we've always we've always operated a semi-remote policy it's it's um it's important for people to be able to get their headspace in their own environments and be able to you know chunk through work but equally we are a you know integrated brand communications agency so uh, that's fine for a lot of the digital projects that we might be undertaking but when we're talking um about ideation and creativity that really needs to be done together uh, collaboratively um, in in a room wherever that is, Zoom is not our friend when it comes to uh, creative exploration. I, I completely agree, and I think uh, certainly uh, in the in the creative space, definitely for people more junior, uh, it, it's been it's been such a challenge, and you know, getting back to that office environment is going to be really important for encouraging you know grassroots and uh, progression in, in organizations too. Um, if you were going to give us a bit, bit of a background on agency UK and any particular ethos you guys have, um, you know, how would you explain the, the business? Sure. Okay. So, um, well, we're, as I said, we're a, an integrated brand communications agency. And what that means is that we work with, um, medium to large scale brands, uh, both nationally and internationally. And we ultimately help take them to market and help drive market share got various methods in which we do that but being a communications business the components of advertising coupled with uh, with earned activity through social media um, web uh, online optimization seo all of those things factor into what we do tv advertising you know across the whole mix so what we've done over the years and our philosophy has been really that um, integration and integrating communications works a lot harder and delivers more market share for your spend when you get it right. But to do that, you have to you have to find people or have a team of people that are truly independent of the media channels that offer the commissions and sway the bias. So that's what we've looked to build and that's what we've looked to avoid. Uh, 80% of what we do is in the digital space. That's a reflection of where the client's uh, spend goes, you know, where the world spend goes, really. Um, but, you know, year in, year out, we are absolutely omnichannel. So we work, we work across all of them. And has that adjusted much over the, over the last year? You know, you, I'm guessing, like most, you've seen a drop of out of home or, uh, you know, particular focus on digital, no doubt. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, that, that goes without saying. Um, dig, digital... Digital has always been the largest part of what we do, but it's it's certainly accelerated. We've the changes the ch- the changes in media have been obvious. I think, um, although we are seeing now with with the price of TV being so competitive, I and mean, really is the the if you've got the right product and you're looking for a broad audience, it, it is the cheapest media platform to get to reach people by. So we've seen a real uplift in in TV, uh, and we can see that coming down the line this year. But certainly out of home. Has, has been non-existent um, that will make a resurgence as people 
you know, start moving around again, but not much point doing it uh, when everyone's in isolation. Um, but having said that, you know, we, we haven't really seen a, a change in, in press. It, it's been on the decline. It's never been a, a it's never been a wanted bedfellow to the whole digital uh, channel mix anyway. So press has kind of stayed pretty, pretty low under the radar. Um, but we've seen an absolute surge in, in things like uh, Google Shopping, in Amazon, obviously, in independent uh, search for independent brands. Direct-to-consumer has absolutely gone off the charts. Um, all of our clients that have had direct-to-consumer channels have, have seen a, a huge uplift. I mean, it's, it's really been make hay, sun's shining. Um, and those brands that haven't had a direct-to-consumer proposition have launched one with us in the last 12 months. And we've really seen that gain traction. So it's been, it's been very good because we, being an integrated agency and we work predominantly across four sectors, um, where we see retail disappear, we've seen direct to consumer absolutely boom. We've seen food and drink boom. We've seen the health and wellbeing sectors that we work in boom and the meditech and clinical work that we do, um, which is often the B2B stuff as well. We've seen that absolutely boom as well. So with the the direct to consumer side of some of the the European brands have any of your your clients been affected by you know new customs rules or anything like that is, is anyone struggling to to get their goods to to the consumer um, well this is coming down the line so this is a moving feast at the moment uh, I mean, the the short answer is yes the big the biggest issue has been for many of them has been the vat issue so it's that they the the forms and the processes they've had to get through to process their goods coming in and, and leaving Europe mm. uh, have been incurring VAT. Now that VAT is claimable, you can, you can get that back, um, but in the short term, you have to pay it. And so that's, if, if you're a high volume uh, producer, that causes some major issues uh, yeah. with cash flow. Well, I, th I think I think it's such an interesting opportunity for, as you say, an integrated comms agency because there, there's so many parts of that customer journey that you can improve with better comms and educate people, and, and it can be it can be as straightforward as it should be um, to to move goods between one country and another. But we're all just still adapting to it. I think I so. I think, I think the problem is, I mean, we've seen this quite a bit, and there's been quite a lot of coverage on this. But people buying goods from Europe are suddenly finding that what's happened is shipping companies have been charged with collecting the taxes. So the goods are being bought at the same price that they've always been bought. But when you add the shipping on and then the shipping arrives, you have to then pay the tax or the consumer is faced with the tax payment on arrival of the goods into, on, onto, uh, onto mainland UK. And that's been the problem because there's no transparency as to how much these things are going to cost. So all consumers are doing is say, well, I'm not, pay I'm not paying £200 for a coat and then paying another £80 on top for taxes and shipping and everything else mm. they're just sending it back that's creating a huge amount of work for everyone in the supply chain it's environmental impact um the cash impact I and mean, it's, it's just ill thought through um it's silly it's it really is and i think these are the little niggles that are going to eat away uh over the next couple of years as we as we seek to have a bit of a recovery economically um but Having said that, what digital does do is it does allow for a platform that is utterly transparent. It should be the place where you get that seamless experience, reducing the, the number of touch points, reducing the waterfall rates for people traveling through that funnel should be the ambition of any, any good uh, e-tailer. Um, and we are, we are seeing quite a lot of investment in, in the user experience and the customer journey planning. I mean, that's a big, a big piece of what we do here. Um, uh, from a branding perspective, a brand experience perspective, that optimization of that user journey is is paramount. So, our customer journey planner is is extremely busy at the moment. <laughs> so, in, a, in an environment where you know a lot of your clients are being faced with Brexit challenges and you know disruption due to pandemic, um, I'm guessing a lot of the time you've been trying to get them to think you know longer term, not just how how can you immediately fix this from, from a campaign perspective? How have you tried to lead that conversation with? with yeah, so I mean, there's, there's two parts to this. I mean, most of our, most of our international clients are of, of a size where a quarter, two quarters, even a year of trade does not knock them off course. You know, they're in the business of buying and selling big brands and they usually have five year, 10 year plus 
plans in place for what they're doing with them. So these are these are economic blips, but overall they're looking for a growth trajectory of X percent. So if they lose X percent growth or market share this year, they look to gain that next year and, and beyond. Um, Many of the brands have seen this as an opportunity to take market share. I mean, we do see this during recessions. We see small thrive, um, large buy, and we see the mid-sized ones either get swallowed up or go bust. And that tends to be, you know, when you look across the plethora of industry sectors, that tends to be how it works because the mid-sized ones, too big for the small stuff, too small for the big stuff, and they run out of money. Um, so we've seen a lot of M&A activity with a lot of our, with a lot of our, our clients along the way. I mean, one, one of our clients, since we were appointed, their North American Meditech company, since we were report, uh, appointed about eight months ago, they've made three acquisitions. And these are major, you know, $100 million de- deals, mm. you know. So that's been, that's been interesting because um, in growth, you always find chaos. And really, from a communications perspective, what you really don't want, what you want to avoid at all costs is chaos. It's about building brands is about consistency. Um, And to achieve consistency and regularity, you can't be reactive in the short term. That's not to say that we aren't. And that's not to say that our client brand teams aren't. Um, They have to be. They've all got quarterly sales targets, whatever it might be. Um, But the truth is, if you want to build a Kellogg's, you've got to spend... 60 years doing it, doing the same thing year in, year out. And, and that's how you, how you penetrate large markets and, and take over. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been interesting. We've certainly seen certain sectors uh, thrive and we've seen other sectors sort of almost switch off overnight. So, sorry, the, the second part to that point was that I've, I've noticed in a lot of these sort of press junkets that I've been doing recently and, and interviews and, and a few podcasts, I did one recently on growth and people are talking about moving out of survival and looking forward into into post-pandemic. So we've got this strange situation of pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, new normal, and it's everyone talks about survival. Well, nobody looks to survive only to die tomorrow. Survival is about growth uh, beyond that phase. If, you're, if your business isn't going to survive in three months' time, there's no point keeping it alive and resuscitating it now. You might as well switch it off. So I've never really subscribed to this a view of survival. I've subscribed to the view of, you know, you survive to thrive. So it's all part of a journey. It's all part of a growth plan. Yes, things have been a little bit tricky um, this past 12 months, but opportunities have also presented themselves that wouldn't have done otherwise. And I think some of the opportunities that have presented themselves are probably better for long-term growth uh, than short-term gain. So you've just got to stick with it and stay in the game if you believe in your proposition, if you believe in your service offering, and if you believe in your client base. Is the service offering at agency going to to change or evolve at all? Do you think, are you happy with the, I guess, the balance of the team or the way you operate? Is that going to, you know, continue to sustain the business? Yeah, I mean, I think we see a shift anyway. I mean, any any agency, any integrated agency, I, I usually describe it a bit like a python swallowing a goat. It sort of travels through the through the system, and um, and at various stages, you've always got a bottleneck until it's relieved, and then you've suddenly got no work. So we find we've always found that um, you know certain times of year, our planning and our strategy teams, our brand strategy teams, and our media planning teams are extremely busy because they're laying out the plans for the year, but we might find the creative teams relatively quiet. And then suddenly when that's done, the creative teams become really busy and the, and the planning teams are relatively quiet. So it's a constant juggle or it's a constant game of keepy uppy um, to try and keep uh, to try and keep everybody busy all of the time when you're integrated. If you're a, a niche service provider and you only do one thing, then it's easy to keep yourself busy only doing one thing. It's harder to find the opportunities perhaps, but when you do, you can keep yourself busy. So um, being, a, being a mid-size agency, I would say, is always easier if you only do one discipline. We don't do that. We found brand communications has gotten really busy over the last, uh, over the last 12 months as people are looking to reactivate their propositions and test their propositions digitally. Um, so the brand brand piece has been has been kept uh, has been kept very busy. We've seen far f- we've seen fewer digital pieces in terms of web builds, development projects, e commerce sites, and the reason for that is that people have been so busy servicing their own business, their own consumer bases. They haven't 
wanted to invest in changing anything. You know, if a bit of a case of we need, we know it needs updating, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So the ongoing day-to-day retained based optimization work Absolutely. That's been on fire. But the bigger project pieces, that's definitely quietened down. And that's that's also um, a result of the, the client teams being, you know, some of them have been furloughed. Some of them have had their own um, that stretched across their own jobs. There's been all sorts of issues with isolation. So they haven't had the physical manpower to push through some of these larger digital transformation pieces anyway. Um, but media has remained very, very active. Um, and the creative and the social media work, community management work that we do here with the teams in-house, um, all the social media has just been on fire. That's an interesting point. I mean, certainly from a, because we're, we're very build focused, we, we had a, a quieter year last year. And then over the last few months, it really picked up. And it felt like come January this year, it felt like everyone wanted their build project to start. Every project that needed to be done in a in the financial year still needed to be done in the financial year but well, they've got um, to get the, they've got to spend uh, the the budget haven't they a lot of, exactly um, yeah so 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 and and i guess that's probably a, a similar sort of scenario to, to what you guys face is when when that demand does come back and people are kicking off the, these larger projects in in the bigger brands um how do you deal with the sudden influx of work how do you scale your specific teams or, or cope with that influx in demand can you anticipate it can you do you have kind of freelance resource that you can expand to scale to if you need yeah to? i mean every, every agency has got a, a, a freelance pool and we've, we've got a we've got an established freelance database that we do go to but let's not forget that if you go to a freelance pool that pretty much eats the profit out of any bit of business so you have yeah. to take a you have to take a, a a macro view of it is it worth you know, is it worth delivering the work um, if you're going to make less and you could focus your attention elsewhere? If you are going to deliver the work, what are the reasons for delivering it? Is it because it's an existing client and you want to maintain that that uh, that digital focus with them? Um, or is it that you want to get into a new sector, you want to build your case studies? You know, there, there might be 101 business reasons that aren't just about profitability on a job. But when you put an army of freelancers, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't stack up. Um, it's difficult to manage um, and it just eats the profit very, very quickly. Now, what the, I think what has been a challenge for us and, and actually a challenge for many of the agency owners that I've, that I've spoken to over the last 12 months is that in lockdown one, March, April, May, things just stopped and they stopped because nobody knew what they were doing and nobody had was able to sanction any work particularly. So we did all see a, a, a dramatic drop off um, in revenues and the projects were just put on hold. Now, they were just put on hold. They weren't stopped. They weren't pulled. They were just put on hold, which ultimately meant that they all came back again. But they all came back again with all the additional work that needed to come in later in the year. So you end up in a position where you're trying to compress six or nine, 12 months work into a six or nine month period. Now being a service business, you don't have the manpower. You don't, we don't have 35% of, of um, availability or capacity to simply just absorb that without increasing base cost. So you end up paying twice. You pay for the period that's fallow and then you pay more to resource the period that's really busy. And when you aggregate that across mm. the year, it doesn't make commercial sense to do it. So you have to be sensible as a small as a smaller independent agency, you know, you know, turning over four, four and a half million a year. You've you've got to be quite careful about where you deploy your resource and what resource you actually bring into the team. You can you can create chaos. Add on that a layer of new business, which has been pretty active for us over the last uh, 14, 15 months. Um, and that's additional work that's not even paid for. And you probably don't get the benefits of that work with, with you know, longer term retained clients for at least six months as you're going through that onboarding and that learning period. So, well, three to three to six months. So when you add that in there as well, you've, you, you very quickly run out of capacity. And I think that would be the problem. That would be the, the issue for most agencies around profitability for the year will, will be how they draw back the decisions they've point. made around that. I don't think this year will be quite the same. I mean, this year has been, I think it'll be steady. I think it'll be a case of growing into this year and probably when the schools go back, which is what they're saying post-Easter, um, people can get back to work. 
Let's not forget. Let's... But I, I, I think you're right that there is a danger of people taking on too much work to make up for, you know, for lost opportunities and, uh, yeah, uh, scaling too quickly, losing company ethos or, or diluting the value uh, along the way. And uh, I think, yeah, the, spe- the, the smaller the business, the more cautious you need to be about it in a way. Um, so uh, do you think there'll be anything sort of longer term that you take on as a, well, this is how Agency UK now needs to be to be more agile in that way? Or we will consider all opportunities in, in the light of what if everything stops for a month? Um, or, or, or do you hope to be a bit more, a bit less cautious in how you approach yeah. things? Um so we've never been in a we've never been in a position where we just take anything on. Um, we yeah. we we take things on that are of value, and and we have a we have a loose grading system for how we, you know, how we attribute a, a, a piece of business that we like, and and it you know broadly speaking, it's around is it um, is it something we've got experience in? Is it something we want to gain experience in? Is it something that's going to make us money? Is it something the team are going to grow with and, and enjoy and have fun? on and you, yeah fame fun or fortune yeah exactly and so you need to you need to hit you need to hit the metrics on that um so we're also quite lucky i mean let's not forget we've, we've been in business since 2008 and what time gives you if you're if you're shrewd is it gives you a buffer you can you can take a tumble you know for a year and have a pretty shitty time and still come out the other side yeah, you dip into your cash and, you know, it's a a little bit bumpy along the way, but we're we're here the year after. If we were coming into this as a startup, yeah, that would be a different thing. I mean, you wouldn't be able to sustain a team. It wouldn't be sensible to sustain a team of 20, 30 people um, coming into this sort of thing without the work to cover, to cover the overhead. So, so I think, I think, Will it make us, your question, will it make us more agile going forward? I think we're pretty agile anyway. I think if we're any more agile, things would probably start coming off. So, you know, you, you, it's, it's nice to think that you're constantly flexible and eternally agile. But the truth is, uh, agility costs money that very often clients don't want to pay for. So the more flexibility you introduce, mm. the less profitable you're going to be and the more pissed off your, uh, your team are going to be, I think. You've got to stick a stake in the ground and say, we're delivering this by this time and for this much money, let's go to work. You know, and I, I do think that, you know, there is, of course, I mean, if we're talking specifically about build projects, there is, of course, a, a place for, for agile projects as a place for, for waterfall development programs, isn't there? But most clients say they want agile, have no capability to deliver against that, and they don't have any sort of procurement resource to be able to really facilitate and manage what an agile framework looks like. They want to know how much they're spending, what's their capex in this particular year, mm-hmm. and that's what we come back to again and again and again. Well, that, and I, th- I feel that m- people who were undergoing agile projects at the beginning beginning of the pandemic would have ended up in a worse situation than people who had a, an agreed sort of waterfall schedule for releasing something um yeah there's sort of if, as you say a few, fewer unknowns uh less to go wrong less agility is, ben- is beneficial sometimes yeah. <clears throat> yeah good so um any any kind of real predictions or or what are you expecting this year? And so you said, you know, gradual growth, steady, steady growth across across the business. Are you expecting that any one of your sectors is likely to be, you know, your your standout success this year, based on what you've seen um, so far? I think what the I think what the last twelve months has done is it's accelerated consumer behaviour change. It hasn't um, altered the direction that we were going in. It's just made everything happen like it's been on steroids, right? So the move to online commerce um, for, you know, such a variety of, of, of day-to-day things, I think what we've seen is that adoption curve has really accelerated across the nation. And people are people have had to adopt it, and now they've adopted it, they're probably not going to go back. We may see a little bit of rollback, but probably not too much. I do worry for for retailers that have just purely, you know, um, have have uh, retail outlets because I I do think they need to now start thinking seriously. I mean, you look at what's happened to Debenhams. You know, the ASOS have just bought mm. up Topshop, I think, and Selfridges or something. Um, but they're they're 
they're buying brands, they're buying experiences, they don't want square footage. So I think that the, I think what this has done is kind of, it's been that time. Do you remember when Blockbuster went bust? They were told to start doing um, mail order DVDs and, you know, set up a, a kind of love film type model. And they laughed and said never. And then they went bust two, two years later. What's happened is all, and the same with Woolworths, those turkey businesses have just been pushed into a corner where they're just not going to survive. And that's actually just evolution. That is survival of the fittest. So I do think that, Direct to consumer, we'll see. You know, we'll see a, a continued um, propensity for growth there. But then again, you've got industry sectors, and we operate on the on the the margins of, so it doesn't impact our business. But things like um, festivals, um, tourism, leisure, destination, that sort of thing, they will bounce back. They will. The question is, can they survive long enough to bounce back? And I think they are critically over-invested in the furlough schemes. So if we were, well, a friend of mine owns a, a travel a travel only agency. And I mean, you know, what does he do? His business just vanished overnight and they're trying to sell holidays to ultimately get the cash in. But the truth is that nobody knows if, the, if people are going to even be able to take these holidays. So they're having to say to the consumer, buy these holidays and we'll give you your money back or you can change it for another one the year after, you know, do whatever you want with it. Just please give us your money you need some in the bank that's not a sustainable business model i mean you've got no you've got no sight as to when when you're going to be able to deliver your product to your service yeah just increasing your exposure absolutely and they're bonding a lot of these i found out yesterday talking to a to a friend that um you know these these are bonded so you're going to have to pay them back if people want the money back and that's going to end up sort of a, yeah. an industry crash so i think you you do have industry sectors that that they will they will re-emerge, but will the same ones that are around today re-emerge tomorrow? Probably not. You're probably going to find a whole new set of, of brands coming up, and it's going to be a bit of... Yeah, not, not the ones necessarily with the most... Square no, it's going to be a bit like shedding, change, shedding, shedding skin, isn't it? So I think that, you know, we will, have a, we will have a new tourism industry. Of course we will, but it, it'll just be made up of a different mix of, of companies. Um, but certain food and drink hasn't been affected. I mean, we've seen that. We've seen that grow um we've seen home cooking brands that we work with absolutely you know they're going gangbusters looking at additional expansion um into other uh eu territories um and certainly with other industries that we work in like pharmaceutical health and medicare they've got long-term plans anyway i mean they're, they're always looking 10 years 15 years ahead so for them this is just a ripple it's, for them it's very much business as usual well, and for any sector, you'd hope that they at least would have expected sooner or later a pandemic. Yeah. But, uh... Interestingly, though, we do we do work um, quite a bit in the tech sector, and we have. You'd think the tech sector would be really resilient to it, to all of this, but their development programs have been really slowed down by it. Their investment, and largely, I think, because their investment rounds have slowed down, they've not been able to. Yeah, pay. I think there was just a lot of investor caution last year. Every VC firm just you know stopped stopped moving for yeah. a little bit. Um, but then speaking to people more recently, it feels like, yeah, that there is, there is demand and people, I mean, other than people who want to invest in GameStop, there are, there are people who are, you know, keen to make savvy investments out there. Yeah. Um, as you say, it's a time, it's a time to be, to make bold acquisitions and to, to, to expand into new territories, right? Yeah, so absolutely. people with money, to you know, spend. what they say, you know, in, in poor times, the rich get rich. <laughs> that's, that's most definitely the case. I mean, we're, funny enough, we've, we've been, a, we've been approached about an acquisition during this period and it's, um, you know, it does make you think, you know, that people are opportunistic and as they should be, they should be opportunistic. These, these times are the, are the times to, to grow your companies um, where, where you can. And you have to take advantage of, uh, uh, of these opportunities as and when they come along. Um, and being an independent agency, it's easier to do that in many ways. You know, yes, you've got the restrictions in that you're not quite as big. You don't have as much manpower for a, for a merger or acquisition um, because that whole change management process is, it's hugely time consuming and you know it's got a it's got a critically high uh, failure rate so you, you've got to be on the on the ball if you go down down that road but you can make those decisions quickly um i know a couple of people that have done some acquisitions in this in this period and they've done them because they've worked alongside companies in their supply chain the vertical for many years they've come ran into trouble they thought they could help them out so they said okay well we're a significant part of your business we're going to acquire into the vertical yeah and it's made perfect 
Definitely. I mean, I, I think I think it's one of those, those questions that any business owner should ask themselves. Well, if if it all goes wrong, if the shit hits the fan, who who do I know who would want my business? You know, who, who is that? Who is there? Where where we could actually be greater than the sum of our parts and 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 see an opportunity He's mad to get to want in the agency. long term. He's insane enough to want to yeah. take on a money. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Right, maybe not agencies yeah. then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've seen our multiples Good. diminish over the last uh, however many years. I mean, I remember the, the, the multiples could be up at 24, 25% if you if you were, you know, selling into the into the right um into the right network. That just doesn't that just doesn't happen anymore. Well, this is why this is why we uh, we went down the route of um, developing products uh, as well as having an agency. I think it's the only way to get a better market. Ross is always you, you right? to look at that. <laughs> Everyone yeah. I know that's got a product business looks at looks at service businesses with envy, and they just say, you know, you don't have to do R and D, you don't have to innovate, you can just buy talent in and then sell it for more money than you're paying for, and it should be easy. You know, it's infinitely scalable. They forget that actually it's. Very, very difficult because you have a, with a service business, you have a continuous capital cost, as in your people, your capital, mm-hmm. you have a continually rising capital cost, right? It's a bit like being a factory that's paying for your factory every single year. And if you want to grow your factory, you have to buy another factory and pay for that every single year. Um, but if you're in a product yeah. business, you've got an upfront hit. But if you get through that and it's successful, it should be a law of diminishing, uh, uh, not a law of diminishing returns. So, you know, you should get back more than you're investing in it if you keep your digital, if it's software, if you keep your digital footprint, your digital debt, you know, well managed. But um, so so I look at product businesses and think that's where, we're, that's, where, that's where we should be. We should be in the product business. And then everyone I know in the product business looks at me and says, don't, don't step over here. You know, we want to be able but then you enter the horrible, horrible world where you've built a product and you then have to build a service around it to account manage the product. And then you're in, you've got a foot in both, both camps and yeah. you might as well. Finish. Maybe the best thing is um, a friend of mine's an agent for the well-known fashion brands. And maybe the best thing is to let everyone else take on the hassle of innovating and manufacturing. You just buy that stuff, mm. mark it up and sell it into retail or whatever. And uh, you've got minimum exposure. You can exit when you want. You've got to pay up front for all of the, the goods. So there is a cash hit up front. Right. You've got log- but you're ultimately, you're a logistics company, aren't you? You're moving stuff around. And there's one business to be in at the moment. It's logistics, isn't it? Yeah, they do seem to be mm-hmm. flying. But uh, well, yeah, so I guess the conclusion from today is don't run an agency or a product business. But, <laughs> yes. Uh, but if you but if you have to if you have to uh you know stay agile but not yeah. too agile um yeah and and be independent because it gives you more flexibility over if, if you do need to to make Absolutely. changes yeah it's easy minute. to become cynical isn't it my dad always said to me um work for somebody else it's, let them take the stress it's easy i mean he 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 ran his own businesses so uh, he was coming from a place of knowledge but um didn't listen to that so no but it's it's good i mean it's fun to day, congratulations yeah. seems to be working yeah out. yeah absolutely brilliant well sammy look it's been fantastic speaking to you thanks so much for Pleasure. and uh best of luck for 2021 and um yeah hopefully lots more mergers and acquisitions for those clients and, and big projects on the horizon Sounds good same to you nick cheers thanks for joining remember to subscribe and follow us and to share today's insights with other businesses you know who want to stay relevant in a digital first world